All right. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ian Christensen. I'm the director of private sector programs for the Secure World Foundation. Thank you for joining our panel this afternoon on undoing the damage. What are the priorities for cleaning up space? From this conference and others, it is very clear that we have agreement that action is needed to mitigate orbital debris. From our presentations already, we've seen that operators are seeing cost to operations from debris and from collision avoidance activities. We're seeing that governments are implementing strategies and initial programs to develop active debris removal capabilities. But to achieve this action, prioritization will be needed. Debris, as much as we talk about it as a single category of objects, is not a uniform set. When we're talking about active debris removal or prioritizing cleaning up space, do we prioritize large objects or small? Do we prioritize higher risk objects from a known set, or do we look at developing capabilities that can be more flexible? Do we look at providing just-in-time or on-demand collision avoidance capabilities? There are also market and business priorities to consider. How do we put together and establish sustainable companies and markets for debris removal? Where does debris removal and cleaning up space fit into the broader set of an in-space economy? In this panel on undoing the damage, what are the priorities for cleaning up space? Our panelists are charged with answering these questions, not just on the panel, but in your day-to-day -day, uh, programs, agencies, and companies. So welcome uh, to this panel. And I want to just very briefly introduce the uh, panelists uh, that we do have. And we have uh, one more in route who will be uh, arriving just in time. So uh, as we proceed from my right, uh, Dr. Anusha Ansari is an astronaut and a serial high-tech entrepreneur. She is currently the CEO of the XPRIZE Foundation, the world's leader in designing and operating large incentive competitions to solve humanity's grand challenges. Chris Blackerby is uh, the group CEO, COO at Astroscale. Sorry, I almost gave you a, a field promotion there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Astroscale is a global company looking at sustainable space operations, debris removal, and space in space servicing. Uh, prior to Astroscale, Chris was the NASA attache in uh, Tokyo with the responsibility for the entire Asian region. Uh, Jacob Gear is the chief of staff at the UK Space Agency, where he's uh, been part of that agency since 2016, having joined from the Ministry of Defense. Uh, at the chi as chief of staff for UKSA, Jake works closely with the agency's chief executive to deliver and drive strategy and new projects. Dr. Holger Craig is the head of the Space Safety Program Office at the European Space Agency, where his responsibilities cover a scope including space weather, planetary defense, and space debris. Uh, and I see in the back, getting mic'd up, uh, Luke Paget from uh, ClearSpace. He's the CEO and co-founder of ClearSpace, which is a uh, early stage company, a groundbreaking company based in Lausanne, Switzerland, focusing on space debris and in space uh, and in-orbit services for sustainable space operations. Uh, and so I, I also want to begin this panel, as we have in the past, with uh, a pre-recorded presentation to give some perspective on the scope of the space debris problem. This presentation will be from Dr. Satomi Kawamoto, who is a senior researcher and manager for space debris comprehensive measures at the Japan, at the Japan Ex Aerospace Exploration Agency, more commonly known as JAXA. Dr. Kawamoto's presentation will, will discuss debris removal uh, projects underway at JAX as well as the overall context uh, for the debris environment. So if we could cue the video up, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Satomi Kawamoto. I'm a senior researcher at JAXA, and I have been studying debris removal technologies and debris modeling. It's my great pleasure to deliver a pre-panel talk. Let's begin with the need for orbital debris remediation activities now. We have used a debris evolutionary model to predict future debris populations. The Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, IADC, published a study on the stability of the future LEO environment. Results from the six agencies are consistent. Even with a 90% compliance with commonly adapted mitigation measures, the, the LEO Debris population is expected to increase in the next 200 years as catastrophic collisions between orbiting objects continue to occur. 
According to the standard NASA breakup model, a catastrophic collision of a massive object can generate thousands of cataloged fragments larger than 10 centimeters. Moreover, hundreds of thousands of centimeter size pieces and millions of millimeter size debris would also be generated. Cataloged objects impose considerable burdens on collision avoidance for spacecraft, while uncatalogued objects pose the risk of collision damage, sometimes mission ending risk. Because these numerous pieces of debris eventually spread out over a broad range of orbit due to perturbation, it is difficult to remove each piece individually. It is more efficient to remove the large debris that is the source of those fragments before they collide than to remove numerous fragments afterward. Since current avoidance operation can avoid collision with cataloged objects, the biggest problem is the millimeter to centimeter sized debris. They are too small to track from the ground, but too large to protect against. The details of the small debris environment are not yet known. It will be too late if we wait until there are too many small fragments accumulated from multiple collisions. Early removal of large debris that is a source of smaller fragments is necessary. Some say that debris mitigation requires priority over remediation because it is more efficient. It's true. For objects that are launched in the future, mitigation measures should be in place first, but the lift objects already present should be removed before they collide and produce many small fragments. This is also a form of prevention. It's exceedingly difficult and costly to deal with after a large number of pieces have been generated. It is necessary to remove a few large debris per year the objects with high collision probability and in high orbit where collision impact remain for a long period. The result of IDC study showed only statistically increasing trend in the number of the object larger than 10 cm. Some argued that this increase is acceptable, but the situation differs with orbital altitude. Comparing to cumulative collision probability for each orbital altitude band, the collision probability at around 700 to 900 km is currently the highest. But we are concerned that collision will occur at altitude around 900 to 1000 km and the collision probability will increase. This is because there is already a large amount of large intact debris at this altitude where atmospheric drag is low. Thus, they will orbit for more than hundreds of years. On the other hand, there are many debris fragments below 800 km now, but the area to mass ratio of these fragments is large, so their orbit decay relatively quickly thanks to atmospheric drag. Some large debris objects in crowded region have a 10% or a greater chance of collision within the next 200 years, and several hundred such debris are present. If removal is delayed, the number of debris generated by collision remains high, so it is necessary to start removal as soon as possible. There are many candidates for ADR so there is no need to worry about which is the top one priority. The top one will not necessarily be the first to collide. Rather, removing a large, amount, large number of debris pieces as quickly as possible will reduce the likelihood of environment degradation. Candidate removal targets have already been identified. For example, Mac Knight's paper created a top 50 list by merging the ADR targets proposed by 11 teams from around the world. But that is, not still, that is still not enough to stabilize the environment. With the ADR of 50 objects, the number of increase could be reduced, but 
other debris may also collide and so more objects should be removed. The target should be reviewed from year to year and continue to be removed. Just-in-time collision avoidance might also be effective for preventing collisions if it can be dealt with deterministically, although it is not a permanent solution. Among large debris, it is technically and non-technically easier to start removal from the upper stage of the rocket. There are many spent upper stages and there they have few confidence confidentiality issues. Since its shape is relatively simple with no solar paddles, they do not exhibit complicated tumbling motion. Light curves and radar observation have also confirmed that some upper stage seems to be gravity gradient stable without rotation. Because of uncertainties in solar activity and attitude motion, uh, Deterministic collision predictions are at best limited to a few days. It is difficult to predict which debris will collide in the long term. Based on statistical prediction, a large number of targets must be removed, and the effect of removal will not be immediately apparent. ADL has also cost and legal challenges. Therefore, Cooperation from all over the world is necessary to maintain and improve the orbit, which is a valuable resource for everyone in the world, as is the same with other environmental issues on the ground. I hope government will show responsible behavior, start ADR as soon as possible, and cooperate to establish a framework for continuous ADR. JAXA has been developing technologies for low-cost removal of large debris, such as non-cooperative rendezvous, motion estimation, capture, and highly efficient propulsion system for the orbit. Currently, JAXA is working on a project called CRD2, Commercial Removal of Debris Demonstration, with commercial partnership to pave the way for low-cost ideal realization. Phase one aims to safely approach and take images of the spent Japanese rocket upper stage, a real large sized debris on orbit, and the demonstration spacecraft is scheduled for launch in fiscal year 2022. Phase two will demonstrate the debris capture and lowering its orbit. CRD2 will follow JAXA's safety standards for on orbit servicing missions and it will be a good example for future ADR mission to limit the generation of new debris from the proximity operations and the safe deorbit of the target. Since this is a technology demonstration, the target is a Japanese-owned debris to avoid any legal and ownership issues. And at a low altitude to minimize environmental impact in case of an accident. The technology to be demonstrated will be effective for, necess for the necessary ADR to improve the orbital environment in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kal Kalamoto, and uh, apologies for the slight technical fun at the beginning of that video. It's, uh, yeah, we uh, we will work with it, and here we are. So let's uh, let's move into the panel. Um, as we've done with the other panels at this conference, we have a set of uh, initial questions to kind of start things going, and then we really will look uh, for discussion and for audience Q and A. So please open up the Whova app, navigate to this session, and uh, fire away with questions, and we'll get them get to them as we go here. So. Uh, Holger, I want to start with you, and um, it's a similar question to what we asked Dr. Kawamoto to present, but um, our panel is, is entitled, Undoing the Damage. What are the priorities for cleaning up space? If we're going to undo the damage, we maybe need to start with knowing what that damage is. Um, ESA publishes an annual space environment report out of your program. Where do, we see, as, where do we as a community stand with regards to the debris population that we're dealing with and performance to debris mitigation guidelines? Yeah. Um, thank you, Ian, and thanks for inviting me to this, to this very nice panel. I'm, I'm glad to be here. 
Let's start with some naked numbers. Uh, so um, we're talking about um, 36,000 objects larger than uh, the size of a soccer ball, uh, and then around 100, uh, one, 1 million above uh, one centimeter size, and 150 million above one millimeter size. And many of you will know that even a millimeter object is, is still very hazardous uh, when, when impacting on spacecraft. One of ESA's spacecraft actually suffered from such an impact uh, quite dramatically a few years ago. Um, that's the situation that we have. Um, and the countermeasures, um, when we talk about undoing the damage, it sounds a bit like uh, the damage is already complete, uh, but actually the problem is the damage goes on uh, and we need to stop the damage. And um, therefore our environment report not only looks at the situation, but it lo looks also at how well we implement mitigation prevention options. Um, and the two most important prevention measures are passivation, getting rid of all fuel, pressure, and charge, charges and batteries, and to dispose the whole space system, upper stage and spacecraft after the mission uh, as a total. And uh, this is not done well enough, by far not. So the report shows um, that uh, there's still 10 breakups every year, explosive breakups, although we are doing passivation. Many of them are old objects, but also uh, you know, really brand new objects that have been launched, they break up. And uh, also the disposal and disposal is not satisfactory at all. Uh, there's still two or three dozens of, of uh, spacecraft at upper stages getting stranded every year. And there, of course, this is a situation where active removal wouldn't make much sense because you would, you would not even catch up with what is left behind. So we need to stop the damage and then undo it. And you can ask, why is that happening? Is that, is that ignorance? Um, and we are, I believe it's not, it's not ignorance. It is, it, is, it is just technical difficult to do it. Um, after 10 years of emission, to implement uh, a maneuver where you need basically all subsystems to work uh, and enough fuel, that's, that is still a challenge. When a spacecraft comes out of the launcher dead without any function, dead on arrival, it, it will not even have the chance uh, to be the orbit, even if it is prepared for it. So these are the technical challenges we are dealing with. It's a technical problem uh, for which we need technical solution, but I guess that's what we are going to discuss in the next minutes. Yeah, so the, the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So we have to, as part of our prioritization, the prevention, we shouldn't forget exactly. about that, even if we're going to talk a lot about the other part of, of, of the equation here on, on this panel. So thank you for that. So uh, Jake, going to turn to you um, next. Um, we've heard several very high level, very important announcements from the UK government this week, starting from His Royal Highness's um, remarks last night to uh, the minister's announcements uh, this morning and uh, as well referenced in, in your uh, CEO's remarks uh, yesterday as well. Clearly debris removal and sustainable space is a priority for the UKSA and the UK government as a whole. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about where the initiatives in the agency on active debris removal stand? Sure thing. So uh, firstly, just what a pleasure to hear His Royal Highness in particular speak yesterday as a Brit. That was a great moment for me. I haven't heard, I've heard my minister a lot and my CEO a lot, right? I haven't heard His Royal Highness Prince Charles speak before, so that was, that was really great to see yesterday. Um, in terms of the initiative, um, our minister mentioned five million pounds of funding for the next phase. So this will be a phase B um, study, for those familiar with the, the mission life cycle, um, to, to get to our preliminary design review by uh, the start of 2024. Um, so we're using that to, to go down from three companies that have currently completed phase A, um, Astroscale, ClearSpace, SSTL, who I saw earlier, they're, they're the three currently there. We're going to down slip to two from there to, to go to the next phase. Um, and then um, by the time we've spent that five million pounds to, to do the detailed study work, down slip further to one company to take us forward to implementation uh, around about, as I said, the, the start of 2024. And that's important to us because that national mission helps us to complement the other work we do. The UK is the largest contributor to the, the ESA Space Safety Programme. We're really proud of that fact, we're proud to work with, with Holger and his team. Um, we support um, other wider initiatives, um, particularly licensing, so the ELSA-D spacecraft, uh, the ELSA-M spacecraft, to, to look at particular subsets of removing legacy objects, so end of life maybe for Constellation customers. Um, but we wanted to take this national step to try and drive the price point down of debris removal, to do it more commercially, to try and make it something that's standing on its own two feet. 
So it's not always a, a, a government customer making debris removal a reality. We're trying to move it to more of a commercial basis. There's still a way to go for that, right? But uh, the, the thing that we want to, to mention about this, this mission in particular, it'll be primed by a UK company bringing in that, that commercial sector's ways of efficiencies. Um, it'll remove multiple pieces of, of debris in one go. Um, we don't think it's good to send up one servicer to remove one piece of debris. We're going to go for two or more with one servicer. And that servicer will then remain in orbit to be serviced, so refueled, replenished somehow, to bring in in orbit servicing in due course. So this is the, this is the starting mission, this national debris removal mission. Uh, we'll then go to an in orbit servicing mission as we go to the middle of this decade, and then in orbit manufacturing as we reach the end of uh, the 2020s, building on the services that are being left in space by these current missions to build a longer term capability. And that's important for us because we think there's both a, a great market there in in orbit servicing and manufacturing, but also it's part of that low Earth uh, orbit economy. That's something that we think that the UK needs to support for both our, our national ambitions um, and also because it's the future of mankind. And that really can inspire the next generation of students, children, entrepreneurs, scientists to really uh, get involved in the space sector and, and become our, our next uh, skilled workforce and, and great set of people as well. All right. Thank you, Jake. So Satomi, Holger, Jake have outlined both some of the challenges and the opportunities I think governments are offering in response to those challenges. Let's turn to the other half of the panel here, and that is our non-governmental and private sector uh, representatives. So Chris, Luke, I'm going to start, uh, start with the two of you. Both Astroscale and ClearSpace spoke at last year's Summit for Space Sustainability. In that intervening year, your programs, your companies, and your technology have continued to rapidly progress. What updates can you provide us since last year? What are you doing to respond to the opportunities that our government colleagues here have talked about? and what milestones should we be looking out for? So Chris, I'll start with you and then come to Luke. Great, thank you. And thanks for having us on the panel. Um, before I start about Astroscale, I wanna highlight something Jake is saying about, this is a panel about ADR and removing debris, but it's really a panel about satellite servicing. And we're all talking about this uh, off-sited trillion dollar space economy. That is not going to happen without satellite servicing. And not satellite servicing that a government R&D mission funds. High budgets, maybe longer time frames, delays, that's not gonna do it. We need a mature, focused, safe, uh, reliable, and efficient satellite servicing capability brought by the private sector. And that's the only way that we're gonna realize the potential of the orbital economy. So we can talk about all of these other things, but that is gonna be a linchpin for how we move forward. And so to do that, we need uh, vibrant, viable companies to carry on that, that mission. And so then to your question, Ian, uh, we've, been, we've been working on the three pillars that we always talk about at Astroscale, building the technology, uh, working with policymakers and regulators, and focusing on how to show the economic value of servicing and debris removal. We're always doing that. But more than that, we're building a company. We're having to raise money, which we did last year. In December, we raised $109 million. We're having to recruit and retain people, which we've done. We've grown now to about 310 people globally. And then put in place the governance structures and the policies and the procedures that we have to do to, to, to build a company. So it's been an exciting year and a challenging year, and it's gonna continue, but that's, that's kind of to get a, a focus on, on what we're trying to do here. We're, we're both trying to drive toward a new ecosystem and develop a new economy while at the same time building a company. So um, it's challenging, but that's what makes it so exciting. Luke? Yeah, that's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. We we uh, we follow we follow suit uh, to to give a little how it evolved over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, beginning of 2020, ClearSpace was five people. Um, today we are um, we are 70. Uh, we have uh, offices in uh, here in the UK, uh, in Switzerland, 
Uh, we just uh, um, opened uh, an entity in Germany. We are setting up in the US. So there's, there's a lot of things that need to be done at the same time. I think um, uh, as we as we seen it from the beginning, the right timing to address uh, space debris issues and in-orbit servicing, build up the roadmap for in-orbit servicing is now. It's the time we have to do it. Uh, we cannot wait. We cannot postpone that kind of problems to the next generation. Um, and we've been incredibly lucky that we had, uh, that there's been so much leadership from ESA, from, uh, from, uh, from UKSA uh, to, to, drive, uh, to drive solutions and to start really doing what counts means missions, go fly do something that goes to orbit. Um, over the, the first, um, over the past two years, there's, there's a couple of things that we had to bring together. First one is, how do we make a safe mission, a safe first mission to remove an object which is completely non-cooperative? In the Clear Space One mission, the objective is to pick up a, a part of a rocket body which, uh, which is uh, non-cooperative, which is, has not been prepared for, to be pick up, uh, picked up in orbit. Most of the objects up there are like that. They are objects that are unprepared. Uh, in the future, we hope that this is going to change, that we're going to have more and more docking interfaces on the, on the platforms that we can go uh, intervene on. Uh, but to get started today, this is definitely a problem that needs solving. Uh, so what we did over the last couple of years, essentially building up the team, making sure that we have the right disciplines and competences in the organization, bring together an industrial team of about 20 companies that work with us, uh, that bring a lot of experience in the exercise. And we just went through our first key performance gate with ESA, which has been an intensive exercise where we looked at all the dimensions of the mission. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong focus on safety. I think there's two things that need to be achieved is at the same time an operation that is reliable and safe and that will be cheap, right? So this, those are really the two dimensions that need to be addressed. We have to make predictable operations in orbit. We have to make sure we don't produce more debris than we had before we got to orbit. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, the, the other main objective is to bring the cost of those operations down. So a big part of the Clear Space One mission is that it will allow us to retire a lot of non-recurring engineering costs and, and address all the core problems to make a reliable and safe operation uh, that where we can actually build a roadmap to bring the cost down. And on the, on the UKSA mission, we, we go toward a reusable platform and there's no doubt mm -hmm. that the future of that kind of operation is going to be a reusable platform. We, we expect that there's gonna be essentially two, two approaches. One is for really large objects where you, you know you have to do a controlled re-entry because the object is too big. You have a three ton, four ton, or seven ton platform to pick up. Um, and in that case, uh, the, the mission profile will be one-to-one -one very likely but the objects to go pick up also have a very different cost profile in terms of mission. If the total cost of ownership in orbit is, let's say, 700 million or more than a billion, then it's a different equation than if it is a, 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 a satellite that costs to produce per unit a million and maybe in a replacement cost three million. So it's a very different mission profile. So you have to be ready to do that kind of operation. So we have been working across the board on all those activities and, and have a very dynamic team team on board, that's where we stand. Cool, well thank you Chris, thank you Luke. Um, I think what part of what I'm hearing from your remarks is this is not just about the technology, maybe not really all that much about the technology, it's about scalability and making this into a marketable, sustainable um, service, right, and how that fits in to a broader, a broader in space ecosystem. And I'm already seeing some questions related to that in the chat, so we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. I now wanna to turn to uh, Anusha. XPRIZE Foundation and Space Debris. That's not an association that I would have normally made, So, but I know there are some things uh, that, that you're working on. Can you tell us about the, the, the Foundation's interest um, in uh, this, this topic and uh, whether there might be a future prize to talk about? Sure. Uh, of course. Well, uh, if anything, I would make the connection there because uh, we've been the instigator of commercialization of space yeah. from our inception, and that's yeah. how we came to be, actually. Um, so um, this would be when launched our third space competition. The first one was to just open up commercial space with reducing the cost of access. The second one was uh, a uh, lunar lander competition, which didn't get awarded, but still created a lot of interest. And uh, many of the teams got, you know, 
million dollar, hundred million dollar uh, plus um, contracts from their space agencies. So we consider this the best failure we had because we accomplished the mission without awarding the competition. And this one is challenging. I think the panelists talked about the different aspects of this competition and we haven't finished the design right now. Um, most of our panelists and many in the audience have been interviewed to get the different points of view on where should we focus the competition and whether the a competition is needed. And we've come to the conclusion that it is needed. And um, there are three areas that we're focusing on in order to determine what type of debris, what type of competition we should design. Uh, one area, one issue right now is awareness. Uh, in these rooms, amongst these audience, there is no need to create awareness. We all understand that this goes beyond just the space economy, but it is critical to security of our society and our way of life. Um, but that awareness does not you know, translate in the public. So one of the things we do really well at the X Prize is create public awareness through the competition and announcing the competition and getting engagement from the public. The other one is the technological um, hurdles that has to be, uh, you know, the, the technological advancement that we need for the different kinds of debris that we need to address. And, um, and it's great that we have like three companies that UK Space Agency is supporting, uh, different countries are supporting uh, one or two companies, but uh, another aspect of a competition, an X Prize competition, is that we never um, try to actually predict a solution or approach to solving a problem, but we try to design competitions with very specific measurable objectives that the teams have to accomplish, and we let them come up with their own approach and a solution. And that leads to really uh, novel and, and uh, original approaches sometimes because um, many of the teams are students in universities with very low budgets and just um, really their enthusiasm is what's driving them. However, because of the awareness creation, they end up being able to get funding and create something and then get support from larger companies or uh, you know, government space agencies. And I think that type of, um, you know, a large scale innovation is needed for this type of complex problem that we're talking about. And the last one, which I think different panels at different part of um, these past two days have talked about is the whole policy side of this issue that is uh, a grand challenge <laughs> that uh, needs to be resolved if we were going to have a, a very, uh, robust uh, economy ar around this. Now, um, Chris mentioned uh, the, the fact that this is not about debris removal, and I agree, and that's why I didn't talk about the business model, because I think uh, any company that uh, builds a business in this area, they have to go beyond debris removal and into um, becoming a service station in orbit. And that's uh, an assumption that I think a lot of companies actively working in this area have made. So I think the cost will come down and there will be a business model made uh, around it. We just need to get them off the ground. So I think with a lot of activities around the globe, I think we can get that done. Um, and the, the, just before lunch, we had uh, the folks from uh, World Economic Forum uh, and uh, uh, Future of Space discuss SSR and I think long term SSR hopefully will become like LEED certification. Uh, I, I hope and I wish that it becomes a little bit more forceful in terms of you know requiring it before you sign a contract with anyone requiring it so it becomes something that uh, even though it's voluntary it becomes a necessity for businesses to have it. But um, so long term, I, I'm hopeful that we won't generate a lot more debris, but we're at the point like our, um, our, our environmental issues, we're at the point that we can't wait until a point that we say, okay, there won't be any debris. We've done so much damage that we do need to clean it up. And um, we're looking at uh, three options right now. Of course, one is rocket bodies that will look like a single mission, not reusable, um, 
it could, from an awareness perspective, it will be a good driver of conversation uh, to change policy. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is uh, mid-size CubeSat or larger uh, multiple targets and removing it. Um, and then the last one is a uh, debris cloud, which is the most challenging technologically, but also uh, the most danger. Um, so we're still trying to evaluate all the different aspects that I mentioned between these three and potentially maybe combining um, two of them together uh, and would love to uh, collect any opinions you all have um, directly or indirectly uh, later on. Thank you for that. So I, I, I appreciate the, the, the linkage that you've articulated that as a space economy develops and becomes uh, more present, more functional, more robust, that begins to create more of an incentive model for both the prevention aspects of what Holger was talking about and some of the, the, the solutions that we're talking about. So I think that's a, a point that maybe is sometimes not emphasized as much as it could be about, um, about the, the, that feedback loop there. So um, thank you for that. Um, you also mentioned towards the end of that some of the, the technological and, and type of debris object trades that are involved in, in this. And I want to dive down on that a little bit um, with, with my next set of questions. And so I'm going to return to, uh, to Jake and Holger here. Um, so both of your agencies, as well as JAXA, have established specific contracts to go after specific debris objects, right? Different stages of these missions, right? But we're, we've established them. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the factors that went into selecting uh, the objects that you've, um, you've selected for those missions? Sure, so, so our mission, our national mission, and obviously we're closely involved in the Adrios mission too, is going after multiple targets. I, I talked to Wright about, about having one service and bringing out multiple targets. So for us, those targets have to be UK owned. They have to be on our list, uh, on, our, on our catalog list. That removes some legal barriers to, to um, removing other countries' debris, and it also gives us a bit more ability to look at those targets because we know a lot about them. They have to be non-cooperative. Um, so we, we don't want them to be prepared for capture in some way because we think the, the technological challenge of removing something that's not supposed to be removed is actually the, the greatest challenge for our industry and our innovators. Um, they have to be in low Earth orbit because uh, we, we don't particularly see the, um, the main... Uh, well, let me put that differently. As, as Satomi said, we see the biggest risk in low Earth orbit rather than GEO in particular. So we think that's the place that needs to be cleared up first in our priority list. Um, and so that means that the objects don't have to be too far apart. Uh, if the concept of operations is to so send a servicer up uh, to go and retrieve one spacecraft, take it down to a lower orbit, release it, deorbit it, and then go up and get another one, that means the targets have to be selected in a certain way um, to not be too far apart in either um, altitude or azimuth to, to make sure that the, the, the chaser spacecraft, the servicer, has the fuel to get there and then can stay on orbit um, to be refueled in due course as well. So that to remove uh, multiple pieces of debris, that's been driving a lot of decision making that the, the consortiums have been making. And they're starting to come up with the same six to eight targets. You know, we're, we're starting to see the list coming down a lot now, which is quite interesting to see. Holger. No, I think you addressed uh, the, the very important points there, there already. Maybe I can, I can bring another dimension into it because this morning we heard a very impressive speech uh, by the minister who mentioned three keywords, sustainability, commercialization, and regulation. And I think this is what we had in mind to be brought together uh, in order to make this happen. So um, we proposed a mission, or we asked for a mission proposal better, um, to, be, uh, in, to be set up by industry, where ESA would act as, as a customer and provide one of its objects to be, to be removed. Why an ESA object? Because it makes it um, easier from a, from a, from a legal uh, point of view to start with. Yes. Um, we didn't want the demonstration. So we didn't want to see a mission uh, which, which starts with a sort of target that was, was brought along, but we wanted to really get to a, a piece of debris. Uh, but we didn't want to prescribe which one it was. We wanted uh, commercial factors and considerations uh, to, to take the lead in, in what the object is to be removed in view of uh, future recurring missions. And that's, that's how the selection was done. And uh, I, I see this kind of mission is a technical mission, um, and it will even remove a piece of debris, <laughs> so it will even add, add to the cleaning list. 
but it is also a piece of policy uh, because we see it um, as also a one of the vehicle to uh, tackle the problem of undoing the damage, um, but also preventing the damage from growing further. Um, th this is something that we call the zero debris policy, which is something I want to come back to. So where, where you make active removal actions mandatory so that uh, they become, uh, whenever, whenever disposal fails, uh, which, first of all, we stipulate a better behavior on the disposal side um, and for the remainders, because technical systems will always have a certain failure rate, creates a market for the removal with the net effect that nothing is left behind. So something that you have in every national park, right? With the stuff that you bring in, you need to, you need to get out again. This is, this is what we want to achieve um, and uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps set up in ESA for our own missions by 2030. And no regulator will do that when we don't see that uh, the technology is working um, and working cost efficiently. And therefore, the agencies need to move ahead and, uh, and uh, do these pathfinder missions uh, to show that, it's, that it works. All right, thank you. So we've got just over 30 minutes left here. So I'm going to start to weave in some of the audience questions. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see where the path takes us here. Um, so, uh, Olger, you just uh, referred us back as part of your remarks there to some of the, the strategies and commitments that were made, uh, announced um, in the minister's uh, speech um, this morning. Um, and I want to turn to uh, our, our three um, non-governmental representatives here uh, again. Um, and Chris, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with you. So, as I, as I reflect on that uh, on that announcement. Um, I think part of what he was talking about, Minister Freeman, was an in-space economy and the role of these capabilities as part of that in-space economy. So a question that comes to mind from that, um, talking about one government, the UK government making a significant commitment. We're talking about uh, US and Japan and Europe have also made some commitments. Um, how do these domestic initiatives uh, coalesce uh, around uh, a single um, strategy or maybe not a single strategy, but a single ecosystem? And what is the role of, of, of industry-led groups such as CONFERS, of which you uh, serve as our chairman of, um, in, that, in that coalescence towards a single ecosystem? So you're talking about the, the policy aspect of it and the regulatory well, yeah, aspect? Yeah, policy regular aspect and how it relates to, to the, the development of an of a economic ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. So I'd, I'd first uh, you know, recognize again and thank um, you know, ESA, uh, UKSA, JAXA for the the commitment toward R and D development, because that's the that's the that's the big step. Uh, we've got to prove the the technology in orbit to get customers to to purchase it. Uh, we're not going to purchase something if you don't think it's going to work. So we've got to show that it works, and we're testing that out right now with our ELSA D mission in space, which have had a lot of technical successes, and then this is just the next step onto that to continue to show that we can prove out the technologies. So that's the one side that the governments are needed to focus on. And the other is this policy and regulatory side. And the minister you know, talked very strongly today about how uh, the UK is going to commit to, uh, to putting in place regulatory measures, to supporting the insurance uh, as a way to support the entire ecosystem of this commercial space. Uh, but they're talking about that in Japan, too. And they're talking about that in the US, too. And one of the things the minister said today, which I thought was interesting, um, he wants the UK to lead, but he also wants it to be international. Mm. And I think the other, other countries are saying the same thing. So how does that work? It sounds a bit contradictory to me. How does that work that you know, every country wants to be the role, the role model, the poster child for uh, driving this, this forward, but then also wants to work internationally? I think it's possible. I think we can do it. But we do really need to, to, to work together um, on how that happens, both you know, at the government level, but then with the, with the commercial sector as well. And, and Ian mentioned uh, CONFERS, or CONFERS, or CONFERS. Uh, we we um, might solve that. I'm the chair, Maybe. and I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, so CONFERS, um, as an industry body that is focused on this as well, focused on developing best practices and standards to drive us forward. Now, that sounds like the same thing the minister talked about today. So how do we make sure that the industry groups are also part of this? How do we make sure we're not developing siloed ideas and concepts uh, that, aren't, that are developed in parallel? 
Uh, and that's, that's something that uh, I don't think we have a good answer for yet. But, but it is something that uh, I think we need to address holistically. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing on Confers now is we're having government agencies able to join as uh, observing members, which we didn't before. Confers has been around for five years, and for these first five years, it's been an industry-only group. But we recognize we need to expand that, uh, that membership. And then to show about the, the influence, I'll end on this, the, the influence of the industry and the growth of this. I mean, just hearing Luke and I talk about everything that has happened over the past year should say enough about how, how excited investors are and people are to join this industry. Confers is another great example. Formed in 2018 with five founding members, Confers now has 60 members. So that's 60 companies around the world who have some interest in satellite servicing. That's an incredible testament to where this industry is going. Uh, and that's thanks to investment and support from the governments, mm -hmm. and it's thanks to investors who recognize, hey, this is a place I can make some money, because that's why investors are giving money in, because they want to get a return. So they see that this is a real viable industry. And so now we just need to continue to talk between the industry and the governments to make sure that we're going to coalesce toward the, same, toward the same goal. Now, I said all that stuff, and I don't have a good answer for your question, Ian, so I'm sorry. I'll turn that over to Luke. Luke, yeah, what do you uh, think? Do you think yeah, how do you think we can work on that? Uh, I, th I think, actually, that the, they're complementary uh, in the sense that policy will essentially drive what, uh, the what, right? The, what should be done to have a striving, sustainably striving space industry, a space economy, right? And conference is more about the uh, how, right? How, what, what are the right standards? How do you kind of make, it predict, make, make those services predictable and define where the quality standards should be to make sure that what's implemented is actually safe and working as it should and that we all kind of speak the same language? So I think it's a very complementary uh, exercise. Uh, one, one thing that really strikes me is that for years I've been in a lot of conference and there's a lot of talk, right? We talk a lot. We talk a lot about uh, the fact that something, something should be done. Uh, we talk a lot that at the beginning it was about having better data. Every, everything was about we should have more better data. Um, and then it was about, and what we hear a lot is, is it the smallest, the, the largest small debris? I'm sorry if you have a question about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> is it the largest small debris that should be addressed first? And, and all those are talks. Should there be policy that talks as well? I think the question is action. What we need is action. And what ESA does, and, and, and what UK is saying, what JAXA does, is, is action. Mm -hmm. And, and um, action means not only deciding we do something, but also putting money on the table to make it happen, and, and engaging into making it a success. And I think this is really what's needed today. This is where it needs to go. And uh, policy also is action, and, um, and, and defining standards is action. So. Uh, what, what's really the priority, I think, today is action. Right? If I could summarize, act, make it happen, right? Get to orbit, make it happen. And um, th this is a, I think it's a transformational change to the way we operate in space. And it's always really hard to, to predict the future. It's hard to imagine how it's going to work, right? It's a little like, uh, imagine if you invent a car right, like 150 years ago, and you have this fantastic machine, it's got four wheels, it can carry people everywhere, and you tell to everybody, this thing's gonna transport a huge amount of people in the future and bring goods really far, and people would just tell you, you're crazy, that there's no roads, right? And it's impossible to build that many roads, right? It's impossible, it's impossible to remove all those debris. We added, what, 74 new big debris, complete, complete, um, we should see derelict because they're, they're, they're very valuable and expensive satellites or rocket bodies, right? But uh, we, we added over the last 20 years, 74 per year. Every single year, 74, right? This means that in addition to the 5,000 that are on the list of uh, Darren McKnight, right? This, so we should remove at least 74 per year if we want it to be stable, minimum. That's the, that's the smallest amount, right? If we talk about removal, and that's not talking about all the other services like intervening in orbit, uh, expanding the capacity of, I don't know, a geostationary satellite, why not? Uh, refueling stuff. Um, uh, so, so the size of this servicing industry is, is much bigger than most people just imagine right now. It's, it's, a, it's a big operation. 
And this is not about one or two companies. This is an industry. So I want to pick up on that. So uh, let's take what you just said. There's Sorry. 74 objects we need to remove. I don't know. Yeah. The, 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 I can't verify that number, but I'll take your word at it. <laughs> I see two companies up here, and I see some technology development programs. So Anusha, I'm going to look at you and ask you this question. How do we go from two companies to enough to address 74 objects a year? Next price. Next price. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I want to maybe just uh, go back to something Chris said about policy, because Again, policy uh, makes a big difference. Um, and right now, we need smart policies because also in a race situation, when it's a race between governments, it's easy to lower the bar and businesses go where the bar is lowered. And by lowering the bar, we make the long-term problem worse. So it's important while the countries want to compete and be and take a bigger share of this new um, commercial market uh, space economy, uh, it's important to make sure we sort of draw the line that you can't cross and the sustainability aspect is important. As human beings, we've caused enough issues, whether it is carbon from the atmosphere that we need to remove, uh, debris from space or microplastics from our oceans. Um, and we need to really start looking at the circular economy of way of doing things, building things, building technologies that will not generate a problem later on down the line that we need to address. And I think space actually is a really great place for us to start looking at these circular economies because resources are scarce. And as we you know, expand our footprint, as we travel and explore space and want to build you know, sustainable um, you know, systems in space, we have to think about reusability. And I think all those technologies that are being developed will come back and help us here. And what we do at XPRIZE that, or a competition that we launch, uh, we really cast a wide net. So our recent competition, which was the $100 million carbon removal, we had about 6,200 teams register. And out of that, we went down to about 1,000 teams. Uh, we looked at the ideas submitted, the judges, 70 judges looked at all those submissions and went down to 600 teams, down to 300, and we just announced our top 15 teams. So, but to me, it's not about the 15 teams or the one that wins. We got 6,000 teams thinking about this problem, and whether they compete in the competition or not, they are going to, many of them, continue working on it and are inspired by it. And that's how we really generate a lot of different ideas and approaches and, and create activity where activity is stagnant. And, and I think um, I'm very happy to see as many companies as we have in the space to removal and, and orbit service, in, in orbit servicing. Uh, because uh, I, on the other side, I go to the space investment conferences and I see all these amazing ideas of businesses in space. And as you said, Chris, they can be successful if they don't figure out how to stay in orbit and do it sustainably, cost-effectively, and they can build all the technologies themselves. But whether it's energy, manufacturing, health, and other production in space, earth observation, communication, all sorts of things that we're doing we need this type of technology that needs to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So uh, about 20 minutes remaining, and I'm going to do something that I did in my other panel the other day. We're going to go into a, a, a lightning round here so that I can get to some of the questions that are from the audience that aren't, uh, that there's, uh, your great audience, there's many more that we're going to be able to address in that 20 minutes. So I want to get through, uh, through a few of them. So I'm going to put people on the spot. Um, as I go here, now I had a question and scrolled down. So give me uh, just a just a quick second to. Uh, okay, so uh, Luke, I'm going to start with you because you're you know, my closest victim here. Um, <laughs> so uh, if we take as an assumption that we are going to have a commercial market for ADR services, it's not going to be a government solely dependent upon government. Um, what is what is commercial industry's incentive to pay for debris removal? Okay, right now. Right now and right in the future, now. yeah. Yeah, right. Right now, right now, non. What the the at this stage, very little, right? Okay. Obviously, there's ESG incentives, right? The the operators want to be re, uh, sustainable and responsible. Uh, the dimension of responsibility is really important. If you look at what OneWeb did, they really integrated that from the start in their 
um, in their um, uh, in their in their in their concept. Um, what of the the question will be how much will they be ready to pay? Right? Uh, we all very sustainable until we have to pay for it, and that's the, that's the more challenge, challenging part. What what we believe will happen is that those are you, you can just look at the trends, right? The trends of how, how this is all going to evolve in the coming years. And, and they're predictable. You can see how many more launches per year and how this is growing. You can see how many more uh, debris in orbit and how this is growing. And then you can see also how much profit is going to grow in the Earth orbit and how low Earth orbit's shifting slowly to a profit center from a cost center. I mean, a few years ago, not much money was made in LEO, right? We were starting making a lot of money. So if you disrupt an operation that does a lot of money, that's definitely going to be liabilities much more than if, if no money is made. So we think that all those trends go in a direction where at some point the change will just be absolutely necessary and that's to pass with the either uh, once operators made their, make their calculation of risk and risk profile, they feel they should be assured, insured about, uh, against uh, uh, failures, right? Um, li like cars are on the motorway. Uh, the, the other aspect is very likely that policy will be written to cover for that and it will Push, in, uh, push operators to actually be insured as we don't let the car go on the motorway uninsured, right? Yeah. Uh, the same, we don't let the satellite go into space uninsured for what could actually degrade the environment. So we don't know exactly what will happen first. What we can see is that all the trends drive to a point where the equilibriums are going to change. And most of the change in the history happen abruptly and, it's, and everybody's surprised, but then if you really look at it, it's just underlying trends that reached a level where the, the balances, the equilibrium changed, right? And that's what we, that's what we uh, look at when we look at the future. So we think this is going to happen uh, just because it's unavoidable. Right. All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Holger, uh, for you, the, we've been talking a lot about ADR um, on this panel. Uh, question is, what is the potential of impact of ADR on space sustainability compared to the impact and this positive impact of design practices, so satellite design practices, or things like carrying capacity threshold metrics? It's a big question to ask oh, at, that's, shortly, but um, yeah. There's, there's a lot in there. Um, um, I think we need all of these. They belong together. Um, I, and I think it should be a trade-off. Um, I believe we should not wait for a situation where, where where uh, active removal and all these kind of measures become um, driven by, by the risk, that will be a bit too late. We need to, we need to provide a, a policy incentive already now. Uh, and, and in our view, and our director general very much supports this, and um, we also hope that our member states support this, is that we can achieve a situation where, where for, for our missions, um, the, the object will have to be mitigated, whatever it takes. And then it's up to the designer to invest more into the technology on board uh, to have the, the right redundancy to make it work or use the deorbiting kit or use um, active removal. Uh, it doesn't matter in the end, the object needs to be out. Uh, we need to provide the technology for that, that is clear. No regulator will move when this is not there. Uh, but uh, as an agency, we can also move because we could make that already applicable to our own missions and then, uh, and, and then hopefully pave the way uh, through this. Sustainability rating is, is something else. Uh, th there, I think sustainability rating will play a role once we, once, we, once we manage the situation of you know, stopping the creation of new debris. We need to look at the past and we need to look at what has been left behind in the history of spaceflight. And there, um, that will probably, you know, you have nobody to, to charge the responsibility for because these objects have been left decades ago. And there, this is a different mechanism policy-wise. Um, but also the selection of the object will then be driven not so much by the owner, but it will be driven by the criticality on the environment. And there we can use uh, the sustainability rating to identify how critical uh, an object is. All right, thank you. Jake, you're next in the, in the row here. Um, and before I ask this question, I just want to again say it was a pleasure working with you and really appreciated how great of a partner you were. Can I ask a dangerous question now? Go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, for the UKSA, uh, would you, along with technology development program and the funding initiatives announced this morning, would you also consider regulatory requirements and, uh, and incentives for operators to purchase ADR or do PMD as a, as a regulatory uh, mechanism? 
Sure, we would definitely consider that, I think so. Um, I don't think we do it unilaterally. I don't think we do it without other nations, other regulators around the world doing the same thing. And that's kind of what you spoke to earlier, and, and yourself and your shapes. It's about uh, like-minded nations doing the same thing at the same time to make it clear to, to you guys from the, the commercial sector and academia what is the, the right thing to do and, and the fact that you can't go somewhere else, a different jurisdiction, and, and find an easier or less sustainable route to market. Not that people want to do that now, because corporately, ESG is, is stopping people doing that. But I don't think we do that on our own as a regulatory nation, because actually, we need to do it with our like-minded partners too. That wasn't too bad, actually. <laughs> that was good. Good, good. good. Um, Chris, we were Hello. talking, and you told me you wanted some, uh, some, some challenging questions for sure. you. So, uh, so I've got one. Um, how do we deal with dual-use concerns around yeah. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was simply thinking of something else. <laughs> all right, all right. So how do we, do, so, uh, how do we deal with dual-use concerns around uh, technologies like active debris removal and uh, on-orbit servicing? That's such a, such a sensitive one. Um, you know, everything is dual-use. It's about intention. Uh, a pencil is dual-use. <laughs> I can use it to stab somebody. So there's, to, to say dual use generally, it's about, it's about the intention of, of the operator. So uh, what we're building uh, is something that um, is to be used for sustainability and for removing debris and for servicing satellites in orbit. Uh, and that is, that is the intention that we're gonna use it for and the, and the customers that we're going to be, um, to be working with. And that's something we just have to continue to message out there. Uh, that regardless of the customer, the focus is on creating a more sustainable orbital environment. It is not to uh, have any kind of kinetic use. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not to have any destabilizing geopolitical use. It is to be used for the, uh, the removal of debris and the servicing of satellites that leads to sustainability. Um, but the fact is, I mean, even right now, a satellite that's up there could be used in a kinetic capacity, <laughs> even one that's up there now. Um, so it's not, it's not gonna happen like that. So we, we don't, we don't ex we're, we're not, um, we're focused on the, uh, on the sustainable aspect of this and we're gonna just continue to focus on that as the intention. But it's gonna continue to be a sensitive question. I recognize that, yeah. it's gonna continue to be sensitive. It is, and I, I would say that the language that we use is important as well. It is, so, you know, it is. Um, yeah. Target versus, versus client, right? Things like that, right? And, and we're talking about that internally, and I'm sure, I'm sure everybody on the panel is, is thinking about this question internally mm. uh, and, and how best to address it. Yeah. Okay, uh, so um, Anusha, um, to you, there, there are a couple of questions here in the chat about the role of recycling and, and reuse as part of this, and you've already touched on that. Um, uh, in your in your remarks, but as you look at putting the the, the prize to market, um, how do you consider the role of recycling and reuse in that? Actually, it's a great question because we did consider, and and everyone told us then you have to make this like a ten to fifteen year prize, not a five year prize. Uh, but we were thinking of instead of asking the teams to deorbit, uh, to capture and sort of create like a uh, junkyard in somewhere in orbit, designate an area where the uh, relics and the um, debris can be sort of taken into this designated area and later on as technology for the recycling and reuse expands with robotics that are being um, f used for manufacturing right now in space, um, then perhaps whoever or whoever owns that or whatever entity or government or maybe the teams own that, then they can actually start doing a like scrap metal uh, business in space, but um, it is definitely doable. It's no different than what we do here, where you know the cars are taken to a junkyard and taken apart and sold. So there is a business model for it. I think technology of actually taking things apart and remanufacturing in space is still some ways away. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's not going to happen. I think it would be one of the best businesses in space, actually. Yeah. Thanks for that. So uh, I've got about nine minutes left, so I'm going to do a couple of questions that uh, is open to, uh, to, to anyone um, on our panel. Uh, we have questions about 
small debris. So we know there's a whole lot of small debris, anything from the, the you know, below 10 centimeters that we can track to the lethal non-trackables, right, that we still yet cannot track. There's a lot of that out there. Uh, but we can't go up, you know, one and one, pick up small debris. That's not a cost-effective um, thing to do. So how are the technological options we have for addressing the small debris objects that we're dealing with? So that's open to, to anyone who so chooses. I don't know the solution for it, but I can tell you that's one of my favorite ones. Uh, it's like the microplastic in the oceans. It's the hardest one. But I think it's very important if we can figure out a way to, you know, f first is to be able to map this in a way that we can actually come up with an effective solution because you don't want to, you know, go pick up one small piece here and then have to use a lot of energy to move to pick another. So if there are debris clouds, which there are, and we can identify them accurately, then they can be targeted. And I think the technology needed to remove it would be easier developed than what we're thinking right now. But it's the hardest problem to solve, but I, it's one of my favorite ones if I were to pick the, salute, the prize. Yes, as you, yeah. Can I try an answer? Yeah. Um, I think active removal is also a way to tackle the small debris. And it sounds it sounds a bit illogic, but uh, you know the small debris is something that is very sensitive to the atmosphere and will decay more quickly. But every big object that we fail to remove uh, and that is involved in a collision or any other debris generating event uh, immediately recreates hundreds of thousands of small debris. So as long as we don't stop the source. <laughs> Um, of small debris, which, which is the big objects. Mm -hmm. We don't even need to talk about the small debris. So um, I, I think, uh, and mm. thanks to the UK support that we have in doing, in doing together with, uh, with our industry, uh, these kind of missions, this will also uh, pave the way for solving the problem of small debris. And then we can rely on our ally, the, the atmosphere, to, to wash out the small debris for us. I was about to say the same. Thank you. Like <laughs> it's like you better pick it up before it fragments. Right, and, and uh, I think one way, one way uh, uh, Tim puts it in our team, he says it's, uh, you can look at the environment in terms of sources and sinks, right? Hmm. The question is what are the sources of small debris and what are the sinks? You better address the sources before addressing the, the, the population. Hmm. It's a little this, this saying that says uh, I, would, uh, I, would, I, would, I would repair the fence but I'm too occupied running after the hen, right? So that's more or <laughs> less the, the concept here. Prevention is better than the cure, Ian, you said it earlier. Prevention is better than the cure, so yeah. prevent it from happening before trying to cure it. Okay, um, so a couple of questions here that, that kind of touch on the policy things um, that we've talked about. So the, the, the government programs that, that we've mentioned in, in, the, in the, chat, uh, the chat, in the panel so far, I'm too used to the virtual world, what is that? Um, have been, you know, as Jakey said, you specifically chose it had to be a UK object, right? Because there are some legal um, questions there. Uh, so the two-part question, uh, how do we deal with those, uh, those legal questions around international um, debris objects and international servicing missions even? And to Luke and Chris, how much are those legal questions around non-cooperative objects and objects from other jurisdictions, how much of those are a barrier to your business? Right now, uh, I was uh, I managed to sneak into the young professionals uh, session yesterday with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Space lawyers got a special big up, which was not in a round of applause, which doesn't normally happen. Yeah. Like there is really a, a strong place for for space lawyers to, to deal with some of these issues. Um, I think particularly around trying to look at um, how we can have agreements between companies or nations that particular uh, legacy objects, derelicts, may be more open to uh, removal or manipulation from the companies or the actors from those nations. So two or three nations who come together and, and put a legal agreement in place, not a new treaty across the world, just between those nations, would open up a new set of debris objects. If the US, for example, just took that step, all of a sudden a, look at a lot of old rocket bodies, which people aren't really thinking about now, would become fair targets, and that would change the dynamics of the market. So I think there's a, there's a potential there without having a whole new outer space treaty, which is a, a decade at least long activity to, to move ahead on that. Chris? Um, I, I love that idea, and I think it's, it's great. I, I, I've said other times that we, we have um, international cooperation on missions 
across the board in the space sector. I mean, ISS, Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb, uh, Earth, Earth observation missions, you know, science missions, cooperation between NISA and NASA, or JAXA and NISA, but nothing on satellite service. Now, I know that a lot of that comes back to the previous question you asked me, the sensitivities on, on dual use, and I know it's a sensitive subject, but that's a great way to drive it forward. It completely opens up the market for the private companies. It shows uh, you know, cooperation between agencies and countries. So I would love to see some kind of uh, cooperative mission in some form, like Jake was describing, or even more, that we can see uh, an international cooperative mission on satellite servicing. That's, that's a great next step. And, 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 and we know that the, the international component of what we're trying to do is core to creating this industry. I mean, we're, we have a global footprint at Astroscale, and our first mission, LCD, was primarily built in Japan, launched from Kazakhstan, licensed and operated from the UK with ground stations in 13 different places around the world. It's an international business, and so let's make it an international cooperation on the agency side as well. All right. Yeah, we, we, we're still waiting for the agency that says, why don't you go pick up those uh, Russian rocket bodies? <laughs> <laughs> that, that may be a long wait. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> All right, uh, so we're coming close to the end of the, coming to the end of our time. So thank uh, everyone in the audience. Apologies for not getting to all of the questions. Um, one minute each, wrap up question. What are your priorities in the next, let's say five years to uh, address the challenges that, that we've been talking about uh, through this panel? And I will start uh, with Anusha. So for us as XPRIZE, um, really um, narrowing down what where a competition can be effective to really spur innovation, to address some of the challenges that we talked about is uh, the biggest priority for us. And then over the five years that will take for the prize to run to make sure that we really create an international cooperative policy, smart policy across the globe that can really help these businesses come to life and, and survive and thrive. Chris. I would continue to launch our missions, build out the technology, uh, and, and grow our company so that we can uh, contribute to this, to this economy. And, and I would also put something out here that we all should be focused on in the next five years is taking immediate action to pull something from what Luke said, and also to pull from the, the Young Professionals uh, event, which I snuck into uh, as well last night. Um, Neil talked about, uh, about the, the urgency of, of, what we're, of what we need to do and, and I'd say all of us here are working on in, in an incredible industry at an incredible time. And we're, we're growing this, this, this sector in, in orbit. And 20 years from now, we're gonna be telling our kids and grandkids that we were here and we helped create this orbital economy. But the question is, are we gonna be telling them with pride and saying, look at, look at what you have now. You have the sustainable orbital economy that you can benefit from or are we gonna be telling them, looking at our shoes and, and shaking our head and apologizing for leaving them with this polluted orbital environment that they can't use? We need to make that decision and take that action right now so that next generations can benefit. That's a good theme, as you said, Luke. It's act, right? It's act, it's do something. Let's make something happen, right? So we've got our national debris removal mission, five years time, that should be launched. We have an in-orbit servicing mission in train as well. We'll be supporting the Adrios mission through ESA. There's hopefully another uh, mission coming through ESA as well to look at in-orbit servicing. UK hopes to play a part in that. We'll be reforming our regulation, as the minister said this morning, and then working internationally to, to move ahead as a group of like-minded nations. Um, that's a lot of actions, right? I've just said that to myself. That's a lot. <laughs> so I'm keeping the UK quite busy there, but the, we're, we're acting across the piece. There's a lot of different moving parts to this. And I think it has to be a full spectrum approach to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more thing, and talking to you about supporting the XPRIZE as well. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm thinking of three goals that we have in ESA, again, with the strong support from our member states, in particular UK, uh, and uh, the leadership in, of, of industry, uh, and you will certainly pick up on that to see the successful removal of a piece of debris, followed by the preparation of an orbit uh, servicing mission, and the flight of a deorbiting kit. So uh, a device that is mounted on board of um, 
of, um, of, an, of an element that, that is you know, happening before it is launched so that it can deorbit autonomously. So these are uh, the, the bricks and then hopefully also with the help of our member states allowing us to tighten our own policy for ESA missions that by 2030 um, every object that we bring up we must also bring down uh, using whatever mechanism we have uh, by then and hopefully we will be allowed to, to do that move as well in the next five years. And we're going to win an X prize. <laughs> <laughs> we so. would love for you to participate. Yeah. I'll try. We'll it try. will be a challenge. <laughs> we'll, we'll try. Uh, Besides that, we, we obviously the, we, our objective is to demonstrate uh, a, the, the full value chain of a removal, completely of a non cooperative removal, uh, which is quite a challenging exercise, I have to say. It's, uh, it's, and we're really lucky to have the support of ESA's as team on that. Uh, they've developed uh, the reusable platform, being able to bring the cost down. That's our priority, and uh, beyond that, make uh, build up an amazing team. That's that's what we focus on. All right. Well, thank you all. I look forward to be back here in five years at the <laughs> ninth <laughs> summit for space sustainability, where Luke, we will not have talk; we will have results. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So, and we'll <laughs> announce our winners. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, with that, I, I want to thank the panel. I want to thank the audience. Um, well, thank you.